And a lot of folks uh, overlook the state constitution, but there are very important things in there too, such as you're guaranteed in Wisconsin to an adequate education. Uh, now, adequate isn't a great word. Nobody wants to, you know, be considered say an adequate kisser. It's kind of depressing, you know. Check your breath. Um, but that's the adjective, and that's what we play with. The Constitution, Bill of Rights, and a couple of disclaimers, and for those of you who aren't aware, we're being videotaped by two different people in the back of the room, so I encourage all of you to um, speak hypothetically. So rather than say something like, I'm worried for my brother, he drives around to school every day with three kilos of marijuana, but I'm not so much concerned for his safety because he has several unlicensed weapons in his car, his guy who's his bodyguard, but just in case, if, don't do any of that. What you say is um, things phrased hypothetically. If a person were to, or if someone was, or if someone were to consider this and that and speak anonymously and put these things in a theoretical term. Uh, sometimes you may have uh, very emotional circumstances or issues you want to talk about and you can always talk one-on-one -on -one later. Also know that I'm not an attorney. There is no attorney-client privilege between us. So anything you tell me, um, you know, I may be subpoenaed and have to bring that up later on. I'm also not your uh, personal attorney. What I'm saying is not legal advice. So please don't take what I'm telling you and use that uh, to defend yourself in court or something else. Okay, so why should you care about law enforcement interactions with police? Uh, there are a variety of reasons, not the least of which are uh, things that we've seen in the news recently. Uh, since the 70s, there's been a 500% increase in the number of incarcerated people in the U.S. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, the United States incarcerates more people than any other country on the planet. You know how many folks there are in Wisconsin, approximately? Five million. Citizens of Wisconsin? Five million. Five million. About five million. So there's 2.2 million folks behind bars right now. Wisconsin has the worst record in the country for disproportionate minority incarceration. Zero tolerance policies in school yield more and more higher suspension rates. Contact with law enforcement, law enforcement in schools. Um, lead more and more to something called the school to prison pipeline, which I invite you all to uh, research and find out a little more. Uh, there are a massive number of civilian stops right here in Milwaukee by Milwaukee Police Department. According to Chief Flynn's own numbers, there were 260,000 stops in 2013. 260,000 people were stopped. 240,000 the year before, approximately 240,000 the year before. That's a tremendous number of interactions with law enforcement. These are pedestrian stops, or these are stops in a car. Does anybody know approximately how many folks there are in Milwaukee? Yeah, about that, about 596,000. Uh, so it's almost, not quite, but almost half, maybe about 40%. So you can go around the room and figure approximately one for two have been stopped and had an interaction with law enforcement. Now, there are lots of interesting uh, things for you. Here's two links here. I'm not to get your ass kicked by the police. I wrote but E just because sometimes I do this for younger audience, and I may not cover this because I don't want folks to be horrified. Uh, and there are also all sorts of myths that you need to know about during law enforcement. I'll cover one real quick. There's a clip from Breaking Bad, uh, and we grew up believing this to be true in New York, where uh, if you speak to a law enforcement officer and I say, hey, are you a cop? They would have to tell you. Yeah, but shh, I spent two and a half years infiltrating this drug ring, but don't you tell them because they might kill me. That's ridiculous. Nobody has to tell you. Law enforcement is allowed to lie to you. You are not allowed to lie to law enforcement. If you lie to law enforcement, that gives them an opportunity to detain you, to ask you further questions, uh, and prolong your encounter with them. It's just a funny sketch here about uh, a meth addict who's also selling methamphetamines in the park, who actually correctly identifies all the undercover police vehicles the undercover police officers, and then is gradually convinced that the person speaking to isn't a cop and then gets arrested. Uh, if we jump back to this too, um, and taking a look at some of the statistics, you'll see if you get a felony conviction, and when we talk about this proportion of minority incarceration, there are a couple of important things to recognize. In Milwaukee right now, if you get arrested for marijuana, does anybody know what the fine is for, say, a joint, or half a joint, a little bit of weed? First time offense. It's not as thick as it used to be. I wouldn't know. But it's pretty stiff. 
It could be up to a $500 fine. You know what your second offense is for weed? Felony. Yes. Up to a felony. Felony conviction doesn't matter about the amount of marijuana, which could be up to three and a half years in prison and a $10,000 fine for marijuana. Now, we'll talk about this portion of minority contact. Uh, marijuana is smoked at the same rate by white and black folks. And this isn't, I didn't just make this fact up. You can, you can fact check it. Media trackers will fact check it for me later. There's fine. Um, but if I'm searching and stopping a disproportionate number of folks, black folks are arrested or stopped or arrested for marijuana convictions in Milwaukee at 5 to 1 ratio. So if I, a lot of that is based on the amount of stops I'm doing. So if white folks and black folks are smoking the same amount of weed, but I'm consistently stopping and pulling over black folks and searching through their car or getting them to waive consent, I'm going to find that much more marijuana to give out this many more felony convictions for the second time. Putting this many more people uh, behind bars. If you get a criminal conviction, if you get a felony conviction, there are a lot of circumstances here. You could potentially lose your right to vote. Can you vote? If you're on parole or probation with a felony conviction? It's off Only if you're off paper. If you're off paper, if you're no longer on parole or probation, you may vote. You could lose your driver's license, you can lose your passport, you can lose federal aid, you can lose your right to possess a firearm, and you can get a denial of all sorts of federal benefits. Uh, in addition to this, there are lots of obstacles preventing you from getting hired. We have things like CCAP in Wisconsin, and folks CCAP one another constantly. What's your name? Who's your new teacher? I already said pedo. That's CCAP. And this happens constantly. So if you have a felony conviction, it doesn't matter how much time has been between you and that conviction. If it's floating on the internet, this is going to be yet another obstacle to your employment. This is why, and it's another by the reason, you need to know what your rights are before you wave them away. When somebody says waive your rights, you're born as citizens or as a visitor to the United States with rights that are guaranteed by the Bill of Rights and the Constitution. You have to give these away or these are taken away or you forfeit them. Those are the three ways you get rid of them. You forfeit them by breaking the law and then you invite all sorts of other uh, interactions with law enforcement and the court system. You wave them away not knowing you have them. Do you mind if I stop you for a second? Can I have a look in here? Go right ahead. Well, now you've given me that right. Even 10 year olds and 12 year olds have that right. And we'll talk about uh, some of those circumstances later on. So your Fourth Amendment is one of the big ones uh, that folks waive. And what is that? That's your right to be free from reasonable search and seizure. And this includes arrest. Law enforcement needs a warrant, or at least a report, which is a court order, or at least probable cause to search you. Okay, so to search you, probable cause uh, is greater than reasonable suspicion. Suspicion is something that's greater than a hunch. Okay, and this has to be articulable. I have to be able to say why I searched you, why I felt the need uh, to search you. But again, no warrant is given if you waive consent. So, for example, I see this lady here, I pulled her over. Woo! 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 Excuse me, ma'am. You mind if I search around your car? Are you carrying any illegal drugs? No. Great. You just give me consent to search your car. <laughs> now, um, I give you a uh, a, a quick example where I'm speaking compound questions, but for a reason. And thank you, lady, who I've never met before. No, I'm kidding, I don't know. Uh, when you get pulled over, when you see lights in your rearview mirror, what are some of the things that happen? Nervousness. What happens? Nervousness. Yeah, nervousness, absolutely. Oh, snap, I'm going to get a ticket. It's going to be expensive. What else happens? Fear, scared. Okay, you hear all sorts of stories. Somebody just got murdered. They're they're doing this. They're doing that. Now I'm not super impressive. I'm about five foot seven in heels. Imagine you put a bulletproof vest on me, and I got a truncheon and a gun and all sorts of other stuff. And I pull you over. You're already nervous because you see the lights. And my second question is, are you carrying any illegal drugs? You're not going to feel too good about that, right? And it's pretty it's pretty scary. And you imagine all sorts of uh, pitfalls. You know? So folks waive their right to consent. And maybe you don't. Uh, you think about it for a second. Say, officer, I don't give you consent to search my vehicle. No, thank you. What's the matter? You guilty? You got something to hide? You're already a suspect. And why else would I have pulled you over? I already suspect that there's some wrongdoing, and this is why I'm interacting with you. And really, it doesn't matter what somebody that you don't know is thinking about you. 
The outcomes of having this interaction may be much worse. I don't know if you're traveling around with friends, your brothers, cousins, your grandma's getting high, left a bag of weed in the back seat of your car. I have no idea about these things, and perhaps neither do you. It's very interesting, the law enforcement uh, in Beloit offered a new program where they were offering to search people's houses from top to bottom for free to see if you had illegal guns in your house that you didn't know about and you were worried about this. So folks uh, all over were getting uh, upset. Uh, you have NRA folks concerned, you have folks concerned about privacy rights of individuals, you have folks concerned about uh, this very strange new free program from Beloit law enforcement. They actually passed that. Uh, it's just a free program. It's not a law. They're offering this program. You can wave your hand and say, oh, I'm interested in having you search my house. But it's not a law. It's not legislative. Uh, there are always interesting things, and I always invite all folks to get involved in their own local politics. There are lots of commission meetings we don't know about that we don't go to. And I'll tell you straight up, most of them are mind-numbingly boring. You will wait for hours. There's nothing more depressing than listening to 889 and during a song and hearing a three-hour school board meeting interrupt that. Okay, and, and that's exciting meeting compared to many of the other commission meetings that are out there. The Fire and Police Commission is just more and more exciting. We'll talk a little about what the Fire and Police Commission is later. But this is, uh, Milwaukee actually has one of the oldest Fire and Police Commissions in the United States, and at least on paper, is theoretically one of the strongest. Uh, folks that sit in the Fire and Police Commission have the authority to, uh, they're, you can consider the supervisors of the police. So they would be able to tell or approve standard operating procedures that govern police interactions with individuals or tell the police what to improve upon or not. And this also goes uh, holds true for the fire department. The positions of the fire and police commission are appointed in my oral appointed positions, but any of you can apply for these positions. And then there's uh, some sort of vetting process. Yes, my friend. There's a little silly question here for our information sake. Is it possible to uh, press for Commission to be that way. You can suggest anything you want to suggest, and um, I don't believe that can be done without approval by the state legislature. So changing or amending the way the Fire and Police Commission is uh, is chiseled out is actually a state thing now. So uh, it exists that there are approximately um, you know there are X number of chairs and how it functions. That's all uh, state determined. So uh, I'm not sure how you go about it, but yes, we do the campaign. Yes, my friend. Um, what do you mean by state determined? You would have to go to the state legislature and say we'd like to change how this goes. So the, the mayor of Milwaukee can't decide to disband, and we can't put to a popular vote to disband the fire and police commission. That would have to be determined somehow by state legislature. And, I, and I, if you want, I can get somebody who knows more about it to email you more of the specific but I don't know exactly how you go about doing that. It's the first I ever heard of that suggestion. How do you, how, is there a way to challenge uh, the commission to By the Fire and Police Commission? So for example, uh, yes, you can always appeal it. And uh, their website is also listed on the back, and they also post uh, the same cards they gave you on their website. So, uh, at, what, and, I, and I don't want to get too sidetracked from what our rights are with law enforcement encounters, but uh, yes, you can, the Fire and Police Commission does a few different things. They have uh, an HR role where they would review who's being uh, suggested to be in the fire department or police department, who uh, they would approve or, or disprove recommendations for promotion of, uh, of folks working for the fire department or police department, and then they hear uh, petitions. So, for example, uh, if Chief Flynn decides to mete out some sort of uh, punishment or demotion or firing or reprimand for an officer, they can approve that or they can say, no, we don't want that to happen. Now, then through an attorney, you can file a grievance. So some officers uh, have done that in the past where they say, I, I disagree with uh, what Chief Flynn has said and I'd like you to hear my grievance and they will go there with a union rep or attorney or whoever's involved. And so it has almost a, a, a court-like uh, feature in that regard. Are there time constraints on I'm sure there are time constraints on a lot of that. I couldn't tell you what those time constraints are. There are time constraints to uh, bringing forward a, a complaint though. So for example, if, uh, if my friend here uh, alleges that 
Uh, I, as a police officer in Milwaukee, uh, disrespected her, called her out of name, said something uh, offensive. She can file a complaint against me to the Fire and Police Commission. And this is for a number of reasons. Uh, so if she, uh, I called her a name, I was being sexist, I was saying these horrible things, I was saying lewd things, I was applying she could get out of a ticket if, if uh, she was able to give me what I wanted. And she's offended uh, rightfully and she wants to file a complaint. It would be wrong for her to go to the police precinct to file a complaint with, and I'm not implying he's an officer, he's just my fellow African now for this, with him if we're hanging out smoking cigarettes in front of the, uh, the precinct. I'd like to complain about this guy. Can I home review time, please? That would be painfully awkward. Um, also, there uh, is a, a, there's a, there's a lot of things implied, uh, which can be cronyism and all sorts of other things to have your friend or your coworker. So they have something like the Fire and Police Commission, which would receive these complaints levied against officers and um, thereby set uh, procedure for how you would investigate these types of complaints. Sometimes these complaints may be anonymous. So for example, uh, it's an HR thing. So uh, this gentleman up here didn't like the fact that when I uh, stopped him from questioning, I called him a jackass. And he's not a jackass, he's a jackass. Um, but uh, rightfully files a complaint. So that's an HR thing. So my uh, commanding officer may write me up for that or talk to me about that or um, suggest some other training, but he'll never know the outcome of that. And that's fine because we also want to respect the privacy of um, the officers or whatever their HR thing is. When it comes to circumstances like um, the death of Don Trey Hamilton, there was a large hue and outcry for understanding and knowing who was it that, uh, that shot Don Trey 14 times and how did this look. And that was a very uh, tumultuous Thing, obviously. Um, and so eventually that becomes public. So Fire and Police Commission is super complex. You can read about it. They have their own website. They have a lot of things that determine how they work. A lot of those procedures are there. You can find out exactly who's on it. Um, it was through community action and pressure uh, and through community participation that uh, the ACLU, along with some 20 or 30 other groups, got for the first time almost a public vetting, at least a, a meet and greet for my own appointees uh, to be on the Fire and Police Commission. Uh, and so for the last three folks, uh, who were Wilson and Cabreras and DeVogas, uh, these individuals all met with community leaders in open forums like this um, to ask questions and say, why are you qualified to be on the Fire and Police Commission? Or do you know what's going on? And, and are you what, what would you do in these circumstances? Do you have the background or the ability to stand up to uh, individuals? Do you have auditing processes? And there are a lot of different skill sets you need in something like a fire and police commission. Uh, it's one thing to be a community leader or to represent a community. It's another thing to know how to um, audit the practices of an organization or to have a legal background to understand all the complex workings of, of these things. But this is a sidetrack and uh, it's important we'll, we'll jump back to this. And no warrants needed if you give consent. So if I uh, stop this guy and I ask him where he's going and I ask him if I can't um, have a look in his pockets or, or detain him for a second, or wouldn't he like to answer some questions? And he fits the description of somebody I'm looking for in the neighborhood, meaning you know he's somewhere between the ages of 18 and 35 and he's wearing sneakers. Uh, he can decline to do these things. But a lot of folks don't because we're raised to do what be helpful, to questions, to, to, to smile, to speak to folks, not knowing that um, this can lead to other circumstances that aren't as nice. And we gave the example uh, in the back room with Angie where I stopped you and I asked, uh, are you carrying any illegal drugs? My first question was, do you mind if I have a look around your car? She said, no. I took there's no, I don't mind if you have a look around my car. Now law enforcement, if you're driving a vehicle, is allowed to search something called a lunge area which if this gentleman is driving a car, would be the area right around his visor here, the dashboard under the seat. And that's a really important thing, especially for safety. If I'm a sheriff and I'm pulling you over on the side of the road, it's dark and you're moving around, I want to make sure that I'm not going to get shot. You can just hide a weapon, throw a kilo of coke under the seat, uh, whatever it is that, that you've got that may be life-threatening to me. The rest of the car, you have to consent. Unless, of course, I catch you and I have now a problem cause. It smells like weed when you roll down the window for me. I see empty and leaking 40 ounces rolling around and you appear to me to be inebriated. Uh, or you just smell like old English. Um, and I'm a clone. 
uh, <laughs> then these are all reasons for me to stop you from sobriety check to search around your car. I hear screaming and kicking from the trunk. I mean, these all seem like no-brainers, and it's not deer hunting season. Uh, these are all reasons why I'm going to search your car now, and there's nothing you can do about that. There's no right to wait. If an officer sees a crime being committed, it is their obligation, and we want them to fulfill this obligation to stop the crime from being committed. Uh, it's these other opportunities where you waive consent for these 240,000 stops, which are a bit excessive, where you hear community folks talking about coming back from shopping and being detained in the rain for long periods of time. Young people being handcuffed while folks are searching through the car and then just let go of the warning. Individual stop, do you know why I pulled you over? No, we'll get in the car and we'll have a look around. Now remember, I can lie to you as a law enforcement officer. I can say that I'm looking for something. I can uh, imply that you fit the description of something. I can do all of these things. It doesn't mean that you don't have rights. You have to advocate for your own rights. And there are a lot of things you don't realize. For example, can a police officer put a wireless GPS tracking device on the bottom of your car without a warrant and follow you around on his laptop? I don't know. You see guys say no, right? Yeah. Sounds crazy. He can. The ACLU felt that that was a violation of your rights, but that case was lost. Now, Michigan in general happened to be on the cutting edge of like uh, technology violations in civil liberties. They may not be able to fix their potholes, but gosh, they got some tech. Yes, my friend. Is that a state by state issue or is that a federal? It's a federal issue. Yeah. As, as I understand it, it's all 50 states and Puerto Rico and Guam. Without your consent. Without your consent. A police officer can put a tracking device. Yes. No, that's different, we'll talk about that. But, but Milwaukee um, does have something called the Stingray, which the ACLU also believe should be illegal. Now, Stingray is an interesting bit of technology, and I don't recall if there's 16 or 18 cities that have received this, but Stingray technology spoofs your cell phone. What is that? And we're going to explain it. I just want to use the word spoof. It's like fruit. Do you know what a fruit is? Fruit? I just learned this. Oh, no, it's a snood, excuse me. A snood is those weird little neck scarves that come up that you've seen more of. It's just like a kind of solid piece, like the turtleneck, but without the shirt. No, that's a scarf. <laughs> I wasn't being snooty. Uh, so anyway, spoof means to trick. So for example, if, uh, if the folks in the back row were uh, at a demonstration and uh, they were in City Hall and they were texting or making phone calls out, a van, and the, the top piece looks a little like um, the radar sonar that you see on, on boats, the smaller ones. Um, would be outside, and what they would do is my communication looks for a cell tower. If you're making a phone call, it looks near a cell tower before it gets routed. Stingray runs to, the, to this um, device first before it goes to the cell tower. So it spoofs into thinking that. So I may not be able to hear what you're saying. Now, I need a warrant to be able to tap your phone. But um, the Stingray allows me to see who is calling out and to whom. And so now I've got all this, ah, uh, that guy in the back is calling this other guy again. And now I can do reverse lookup and I can find out more or less pretty effectively any of you can, who owns what phone number, where that is, where you're at. And remember technology, and, and Wisconsin has two fusion centers, one in Milwaukee, one in Madison, um, aggregates a lot of this information through so your Facebook accounts, your Instagram, your Twitter, Snapchat, all these different things, all this information, credit card purchases, your online statements, the things that you think are anonymous on blogs or, you know, Journal Sentinel, chat online, responses, all this gets aggregated and creates profiles where um, it's shared between local law enforcement, FBI, um, and all sorts of other folks. So uh, it's very easy to find out information and share information. Now, this may not sound super scary, but more and more our personal lives are intertwined with media. So I don't know if you uh, saw on the news most recently, uh, Illinois just passed legislation which makes it so that colleges, and at least this is the article I read on Fox 6 this morning from Illinois, uh, Fox in Illinois, not Fox 6, colleges as well as high schools, public high schools and public colleges have to give, uh, the students have to give their social media passwords to the school so that they can log in and see. Now what does this mean? This is done under the auspices of stopping bullying, right? Bullying is bad, people do horrible things, people commit suicide behind this, there's, there's all sorts of torture, psychological. So, um, and you can read the specifics, and I'm not familiar with all the, the, the exact verbiage of the legislation, 
But if I suspect that the gentleman in the back was bullying somebody and said something nasty online on Twitter or Facebook, I can demand as a faculty or school admin this password. So all of your information that's there, all of your other contacts, all your stuff about, oh, my parents are going through divorce, or I'm not happy with this or that, or this guy like you, et cetera, so forth, is now a public viewing for other folks in school. Now also, as a parent, I have three kids. Um, you want to know important things like this. Almost everybody has smartphones now, but how many folks are locking their smartphones? Uh, and this is important too. And we'll have another true or false question since everybody answered the first one correctly. Um, can law enforcement ask to see the contents of your phone? Excuse me, I you videotaped something very important. I'd like to see that real quick. Who says they can't ask to see the contents of your phone? They can't. Who says they can't ask to see the contents? Of course they can ask. They can ask anything they want. Tricky! But yes, they can ask. You don't have to give that consent. Now, who says they can demand it? Listen, um, now, uh, these uh, two officers here are beating me and kicking me and stopping me, and they see that you, I haven't picked on you yet, you two have videotaped this thing. And then they come over and say, we need that, that's evidence of this guy who's believing his wrongdoing. We need that. And if that, what you saw was definitely disturbing. I mean, your heart's racing, this guy, knees bleeding all over the place. I've never had a cat that would hate to lose a tooth. Um, do you have to give it to him? They said it's evidence. No. Who says no? Who says, yeah, you have to give him that, that's evidence? You don't. They have to... Um, they, I mean, they may still take it from you anyway. It's not like the interaction was good. And that's another story. We'll get to that. And you say, respectfully, officer, I'm happy to share my information, but you can get a warrant signed by a judge, and I'll turn it over. Whatever, that, whatever evidence the court thinks is necessary for this. Um, the other thing is you have a right to say and do things. You have the right to curse at a police officer. You can say whatever you want. That's not a crime. It's not the sort of he's sucking his teeth, but yes. <laughs> It's not disorderly conduct. Um, Racine tried to pass a law not that long ago saying that you can curse in front of a police officer. So you too bad if you trip and fall. Ah, shit. It's $50. <laughs> so, um, but it's not true. Is it a good idea? No, it's a horrible idea. You shouldn't curse at folks in general. That's really kind of wrong. Um, but it's not a ticketable offense. Uh, and it's not a fine. But just because you can do it doesn't mean you should do it. Uh, it would going to use common sense. You have a lot of rights. How do you flaunt those? So, for example, um, can a teacher in a public school in Wisconsin? Now you're all students, okay? You're all you're all 17. Isn't that great? If I could do that, do you wish I would give it to you? I'm old. You know, I'm not to be, well, maybe not 17, maybe 18. Um, can a teacher so, um, look in your phone? So, without your permission. They can ask you where you establish Can a teacher look at your phone without permission? No. Who says, no way, that's grimy. Who says, yes, they can? Who says, yes? You're all wrong, they can. <laughs> and that's something that's connected to the state constitution. Um, now, many schools have, and there's, listen, there's all sorts of, we talked about, it's impossible for any one person to know all the rules, and I invite you to double check the thing I'm saying. But, um, <clears throat> yes, my friend, you had two questions. A teacher in a public school or an administrator may ask to look in your phone and you have to say yes. And if that student says no. Okay, this is what I tell my own kids. And, uh, and this is I, what I invite you as parents to think about. We're going to try this out. I have a lock on my phone. Now, none of my children have phones yet. They're all little guys. They have phones that make a little scared. Um, so, uh, there are, we talk a little about consequences of interactions. When, when children have phones, who buys those phones for them? For the most part, their parents. Who's paying for those phones? Their parents. Okay? When you have an iTunes account, and your kid is busy downloading their music, or are you uploading their Clash of Clans and all this stuff, who's paying for that? Their parents, for the most part. The Google Play, your parents, okay? So it's your parents' phone, essentially. And there's all sorts of things going on. 
that you don't necessarily, I'm going through divorce, I have to go see my therapist, I'm late to pick up your sister, your sister had tried to commit suicide with pills, and we talked about that over the month and a half, I'm not, hopefully not sending this to my kid to text. Um, this is nobody else's business, there's a lot of personal business, there's a lot of financial business that is connected directly to the parent. Now let's take it up a step and be real. Most folks who grew up in the 80s and 90s had a shoplift porn. That's just how it was. It wasn't free on the internet like it is today. And young folks, when they wanted to get with each other, found a handy tree or a quiet nook in the elevator or a library or a car. But now with things like Snapchat and Instagram, people are doing what? Going to see my boo, I just went to Planet Fitness for my workout. It's a little naked photo of me. And hopefully she says me one back. Right? However, now when this is being transmitted back and forth, you're in, in violation of felony child pornography laws. So these two 15-year-olds, these two 16-year-olds that feel the pros of passion are in love are sending this information back and forth. And uh, I personally believe that these types of interactions need to be meted out between the parents. And maybe the parents in school, if parents want to reach out to these sorts of things, if, you're, if your children are acting out, if your children are involved, if you haven't yet had important conversations about how they are to interact with other people, what is appropriate based on, on what you and your family determine and how they engage themselves, you're now asking the child by like, forfeiting this and giving over this stuff to run the risk of potentially being a felony. And so I invite you to have this talk with your kids. My talk with my kids is, Give them the phone and say respectfully. When my dad comes, you can talk about it. When my mom comes. Can a police officer interrogate a child in school if the parent isn't there? No. no. Who says no? You're all wrong again. Now, theoretically, you have to make some due diligence to call and make sure the child is there. You have fewer rights in school as a citizen than you do out on the street. Okay, there's a lot of school has a specific governmental function, it's to educate. And so um, things that are viewed as distractions. I got a call from a young man several years ago. He felt his First Amendment rights were being violated. They didn't want him to wear his t-shirt. Now he read about this whole bell thing and he heard about the protest in Vietnam and wearing the black band and how you had an opportunity to wear political t-shirts like I hate Obama or I hate Scott Walker or whatever the shirt was, and he knew he had a right. And he said, since strippers love my pole. I said, well, guess what? You don't have a right to wear that. Um, and because it's a distraction, anything that's considered a distraction. Um, so schools may have a uh, no cell phone policy, and some don't. So when I was in a condom walk, I saw lots of cell phones. They didn't have that policy. Most MPS have a policy that has to be in writing that may determine that I confiscate your phone until the end of the day, that may determine some other things about this engagement. Um, so I invite parents to talk to the kids about it, lock it, and say, hey, look, mom, dad, you come in, we'll take that phone out of the phone, we'll talk about it later on. Yes, my friend? I do apologize, right? No, no, these questions are great, but I'm tired of hearing myself talk. Uh, no. So in my case, I deal with a number of students who are 18 or older, mm -hmm. 20, 21. Um, but in the case where they have a cell phone in my classroom, perhaps texting or Facebook or what have you, if they're over the age of 18, do I still have that right to go through that phone? I'm not saying that I want to, but I'm just asking, do I still have that right? Um, I would have to look that up, but I believe yes, absolutely. I don't think the thing, I don't think that it's um, dependent upon law that you always have that right. But um, see what you're, are you doing this, uh, if you're doing this through a school or um, a CLC or a community service organization, it's best to always see what the written policy is from that school. So most schools, especially MPS, have uh, have um, these guidebooks that they hand out many of the other prints, all the rules, and you should take a look at this. These are all different rules of engagement. This is super complex. This is bigger and deeper and more boring and geekier than any Dungeons and Dragons. There's all sorts of modules to the modules. There's different sets of rules that blanket all of us. The federal rules, the Bill of Rights, the Constitution, then you have state constitution, then you have what MPS governance says, maybe what a private school says, um, engagement for dealing with the Fire and Police Commission, engagement for dealing with MATC or UWM, there are agreements, that there are rights you waive as a resident in a dorm, and we'll talk about some of that in a second. Uh, and I don't mind if we get through all of this, as so long as we cover some of the more important ones. So you have rights of reasonable expectation of personal property. 
And this pertains to your house, your car, your hotel room, your mail, your email. Obviously, this is under some sorts of threats if Illinois is passing this thing. Remember, an interesting thing about Illinois is um, you are, true or false, you're allowed to videotape law enforcement in Wisconsin. True. 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 Now, this is being challenged in states, and interestingly, Massachusetts and uh, Massachusetts and Illinois have these challenges. Up until recently, you were allowed to videotape law enforcement in Illinois, but you were not allowed to audio tape law enforcement in Illinois. How weird is that? Um, so that changed recently, but now they're introducing legislation again with the hopes of passing it, saying you cannot videotape or audio tape. Um, we talked about young folks uh, losing through legislation uh, their rights to privacy because uh, they would have to turn over their passwords, for example, uh, in schools. Uh, in your house, you have to grant entry to law enforcement um, and invite them in before they look around. Okay, so here's another big true false question. Uh, who here wants to be the next victim for my thing? Oh, come on. Great. My friend in the back room is having this booming party. It's fantastic. It's slamming. Everybody's hanging out. The, the music, although not breaking any uh, noise ordinances, is loud. People are having a good time. There's all sorts of folks he doesn't know there. It's the end of the year celebration. People from the block are coming there. There's, um, and he's not aware of all the folks that are there. He's just, he's just won a lot. $6.5 million. So he's having quite a slam party. And so the party's going, having a good time. There's all sorts of folks hanging out. And some little five year old kid that he doesn't know who lives on the road answers the door of this party when he hears a knock. And it's the police. And the officers say, Hey, little man, can we come in? And the little man says, Sure, come on in. And the cops walk around, they find some underage drinkers over here, and they find some folks smoking weed over here, and all sorts of stuff. Is my friend now culpable for this? Did they, did the law, this is a big part, part question. Is my friend now culpable and responsible for all the things, all the violations of the law that are in this house? Yes. And did that five-year-old stranger who he's never met before have the right to let the police into this house? Anybody volunteer to answer? Who's now culpable? Who says he's culpable? Ooh, you're in trouble. Who says he's not culpable? Who says that five-year-old shouldn't let him in the house? They did. That's unlawful entry. Five-year-old, and who let that five-year-old answer the door anyway? <laughs> okay, guess what? He's in trouble. Doesn't matter that he didn't know the kid. Doesn't matter that it was some five-year-old kid. Yeah, and we as homeowners are responsible for who's in our home and who answers this. So, if the police knock on the door, and they say, we'd like to uh, talk to you. We'd like you to answer a few questions. Could you come out for a minute? Do you have to go out? Who says no? Who says yeah? What is the trick <laughs> You don't have to go out. We got a warrant. We're just going to kick in the damn door if you don't come out. We just want to ask you a few questions. We do it the easy way or the hard way. What's it going to be? Because what I tell you, these are just rules of engagement. How the dialogue happens, this is very different. You have to remember, you have adrenaline, you have all this hormone movement, you're fast, you're angry, a lot of people get excited, fast, and angry. People get called at a name. If they say they have a warrant, you have to let them in. They have to show it to you. Yes. They have to show it to you. Now, uh, when I used to do uh, work for boys and girls clubs in Brooklyn, some gang convention work, it was a really uh, wild trick that was going around. So the, the projects, especially Farragut and Marcy, were really tall. And so all the delivery guys would come by and take a handful of menus and just kind of whip it to the hallway. So on a good day, like on a Wednesday in the middle of the week, you would have mountains of takeout flyers for everything. Chinese food, number one jerk chicken, all sorts of stuff. So the story was that officers would go by and pick up some of the white handout flyers and then knock on the door and hold up and say, we have a warrant to search the premises. We're searching for a suspect who allegedly hid uh, some stolen insert thing here. And so folks would let them in. They have to show you the warrant. The warrant has to be signed by a judge. and has to have your address or the name of the homeowner on it. 
then you have to let them in. What if you won't have a window in your door and you just see the more? Do me a favor, slide under the door, put it in the mail slot, please. And truly, if they have a warrant to come in and, and you give them a hard way to go, what are they going to do? Bad boys, bad boys, which they always take to an album. They're going to come right in. Um, and the same is true sometimes with interactions. If I can't search your car, are you hiding drugs in here? I'm going to hold you until the dogs come and blah, blah, blah. And they can say anything they want. Officer, respectfully, I'm not being detained. I'd like to go. I don't consent to search of my personal property. And these lines are bold faced on your handout cards. So those are important things to know. I don't consent to search of my personal property. When you got something to hide, it's not about dialogue. The less said, the better. Remember, liaison officers, community liaison officers, are usually ideal, amazing, friendly police officers. The kind that are really happy to see you, they hang out with you, they play, uh, you know, they shoot a couple of hoops with you, they know you, they smile, they go to all these great communities. Um, folks all have specialties on any baseball team. You've got a shortstop, you've got a catcher, you've got you know designated hitters, you've got all those talented folks. Some folks are trained to get you to waive your rights and to give consent. Some folks train to search your car. I do this all day. I'm damn good at getting you to give me what I want, which is searching your car. And so the longer you have conversations and engage in these things, the longer you're going to walk down a trap. It's just like playing chess or other engagements. I know what to expect. If you do this, I do this. If you do this, I do this. And eventually it winds up. So you can say the same things. Respectfully, officer. And we say officer. Sir and ma'am can be trigger words for folks. Sir, you know, there's also things. And you may think someone is a sir or ma'am, and they are not a ma'am or sir that you thought they were. Best to use gender neutral terms, such as officer. I don't consent to search for my personal property. And and be respectful about it. In a car, you have to show your, your driver's license. It's a privilege to drive a car. It's not a right to drive a car. Um, and you have to have a couple other things. Your insurance, registration. They ask to see these documents. You turn over these documents. You may or may not get a ticket if you don't have these documents. Um, the other things you waive consent for. Yes, my friend. I was just going to ask, are there any other ways that you can be tricked um, to allow your car to search you with the detail? I suppose there are, as creative as you are as a human to think of scenarios, as many plots as there are for any sitcom or television show, there are that many ways to engage with somebody. So think of, I think of all the lines I used to, you know, to go out with folks, you know? So all those creative things that come to you in the spur of the moment, those are the same things. Come on, I know you want to get this pizza. So however it is I convince you to buy me a slice of pizza, there's that many ways that I can tell you literally anything you want. And I may read you. All of you are different humans. All of you have different motivations. If I figure out those motivations by, by stereotyping you or judging you, then I can act on those tools to get in there. Remember, lots of folks, if you see a busker or somebody that works for a, a carnival or a salesperson, they read people very quickly. And they know people very quickly. And I know how to engage with you based on the type of glasses you wear whether or not you have facial hair, what hat you're wearing, what decals you have in your car, what music I heard as I approach your car. All of these are different things I can use to engage with you. And one way or another, yes, ma'am. How does stop and frisk Stop and frisk, uh, well, stop and frisk is specifically what they called in New York, but it's very similar to what's going on here. Statistically, percentage-wise, what's happening here in Milwaukee is a problem just as egregious as what's happening in New York. If I have 200,000 um, 240,000 stops. I'm actually, it's called broken windows policing. I'm stopping all these different folks in the hopes to find out that there's something wrong. I'm stopping you, I'm engaging with you in the hopes that you've broken a crime and I can prevent some worse crime from occurring. I pulled you over because your tires were too big. Your radio was too loud. The tint in your window was too dark. I stopped him just because I wanted to talk to him. He seemed like a friendly guy. Remember, there are literally thousands of stops on foot for what reason? To engage. There are thousands of stops in automobiles. For what reason? These aren't, I'm not talking about stops because somebody broke the law. I'm not talking about you were speeding, I pulled you over, and this counts as the 240,000. Yes, my friend? It's just interesting that you mentioned that because every single one of those are best stop. Oh, anything I'm saying, I've heard here in Milwaukee. All of them. Recently. It's a shame. And we love to stop because we believe, as hopefully all of you do, everybody should have, has the same rights to the same quality policing. 
The response time, if you call for a crime to be reported, should be the same as the response time for somebody who likes you and living in a different community who calls to report a crime. I should stop you if you're breaking the law or committing an infraction, not because I have a special card maybe that shows the color of skin tone that's supposed to be here at the time. Remember also racial profiling. We stereotype this. You hear things like DWB. You're never going to sell them. Maybe that one guy in the South, the fire chief, that got in trouble. But um, you're not going to hear somebody pull over and go, woo, woo, woo. You know what I'm doing? Because you're black. This is true. That's not going to happen. So um, racial profiling in general is proven in the aggregate. So uh, if it were true, and you were black, and I was giving out tickets for moving violations, and of 150 tickets that I gave out in one month period, 120 of those folks happen to be darker skinned Latinos or, or folks of African descent. Well, I probably had searched long and hard to find a ratio of 120 to 150 tickets. And there are things like early warning systems. If, if for example, an officer is doing things like getting into fistfights with clowns and shooting people that are sleeping in parks, there should be something that the police department has to say, this person really, we should probably talk to them and find out what's going on in their world way before these things occur. The types of trainings, I worry about some things. It's really important, and I've noticed this trend more and more. It's very important that we provide opportunities and resources for our vets who are returning. Uh, we are engaged in conflicts all around the world, and all these vets need to be supported emotionally, physically, and with jobs. But when I read something for a small town like Grafton, which is proud of the new officer they have who has eight years of combat experience, who's a master sniper with this net, who can dismantle weapons with his eye for hour, wants to eat a tank and swim across the Atlantic Ocean, the super combat, I get nervous when I know the majority of people are going to be interacting with are teen smoking weed and, and folks who may wise off. None of these are armed you know, mercenaries from, you know, some other nation far away. Uh, and so we may be recruiting officers with the wrong skill sets for what we need now. If I'm placing officers, and you take a look at the officers that are placed in public schools, I work in public schools for years. And we all know that the majority of teams are not Hi, how are you, sir? It's good to make your acquaintance. <laughs> you know, I was just going to sit down and do my calculus work right now. Libraries, you know what they say? Zip it and clip it. No, <laughs> none of that, OK? It's not happening. So when I'm an officer and, I'm, and I've been doing very tough, difficult jobs in tough, difficult areas, and now I'm dealing with kids who may or may not be treating me as a white ass that day, or my training is specifically focused on getting you to put down your gun and give you the cocaine and the hostage you have, then working with a kid running down the hall isn't going to cut it. And lots of times, these interactions, um, especially reports I've heard from less so uh, in Milwaukee uh, for interactions in high schools, but say Racine, Kenosha area, when you're running down the hallway, and I'm an officer, and I tell you to stop and slow down, and you tell me to F off or kiss my booty or whatever, and now I stop you and arrest you for this, you weren't breaking the law even prior to that in interaction. You may have been breaking some sort of school protocol or school rule, but now you push me and challenge me in a broken. And so maybe we're training, we don't have these systems set up in place to make sure that the officers who are doing certain jobs need to have certain training for jobs. And we also need to have a more uh, aggressive approach to making sure that officers have the support they need. And if there's something going wrong, nobody's going to come out and interview and say, are you racist? Damn right. Hate all these people. That's not happening. But if it comes out or you suspect, or officers suspect, look, when they had, um, when Officer Mike Vagnini, who, uh, with other officers, in the course of his duty, was holding down black men in the streets of Milwaukee and putting his hand in the booty holes looking for drugs. If this had happened to any of us, we would be sex offenders, we would be charged with rape, we'd be doing serious time. And these folks were looking at not two years, I lost my job. When officers say they didn't know about this, but you can freely see the videos on YouTube from their own service cameras, and they're watching this happen in the foyers that look just like this library, with you know officers laughing, picking up the rubber gloves, putting in an area. But they say on court, which would be perjury if we did this. Oh, I didn't see it. I didn't know about it. Then the system itself is broken, and that needs to be addressed. Because from what I've heard over and over from officers, you make my job harder when you are racist. 
You make my job harder when you're physically intimidating all these folks. Now, how am I supposed to police or serve a community where I'm viewed as an enemy of that community by virtue of the actions, unlawful actions, of some of my colleagues? And these are the types of things, if you have respondents not saying, I don't complain when this happens, that's just how it is. Officer McNeeny didn't wake up, I don't think, one morning and say, I'm going to have my buddies hold this guy down while I go fishing around. Gradually, what happens in general is that folks get away with more and more. I did this thing to him, I shoved him, and I got away with it, and it wasn't a problem. I illegally searched this guy, and it wasn't a problem. I called this guy out of name, and it wasn't a problem. I made him delete his video because I told him I wanted to find something, and it wasn't a problem. Until eventually, I believe I can do whatever the hell I want because it's not a problem. And, Ed Jesper, what do you see in what about all those military equipment these guys are getting? Are those are two things that can really take away? Yes. And it can. And we'll, we'll talk some of that shortly. Um, it's super important that if you see a problem, if you were in a restaurant and a waiter disrespected you, spilled your food, disregarded you, ignored you, didn't give you service, you would complain. You would ask to see something happen. You would demand it. And we tend not to do that in systems of government. We tend to really wait until something really bad has happened. And I don't mean this just with police, I mean this with all circumstances in regards to the government. It's big, it's amorphous, I don't know where it is, I don't know who's accountable. And that's why we have to get involved so uh, much in, in local government or speak to folks that understand how to do these sorts of things. To go to fire and police commissions, I promise you, boring, but, um, but finding three or four other friends, and maybe you take turns, it only means twice a month. Somebody can go there for a little while, play a little clash of plans while you're sitting there. And you each have two minutes to say your piece on different circumstances. And you can see how these things work, and then meet with other like-minded folks and push choices. Of late, it's been interesting because there's been demonstrations of people protesting. But it didn't have to get to that level. So our executive director was the only person I know who went consistently to these meetings. Very few folks do these things on a regular basis until something breaks. And we allow these things to break because life gets in the way. We have bills to pay, we have babies to take care of, we have jobs, we have circumstances, we have relationships, but we need to somehow um, take a more active, uh, robust role in our democracy. All of us, and all sorts of things. And that is the way we prevent these things from getting so far afield. Chief Flynn, what do you have in place so that these types of problems don't occur? Where's the early warning system? Because I know they didn't want to work with somebody who was, who was doing this to other people. I know that other police officers ridiculed this person, but still didn't testify against them didn't necessarily say anything to get this to stop. And it went on allegedly for years. And now, it could conceivably cost the city millions and millions and millions because there are many more people that came out of the woodwork in regards to this. Uh, I'm going to answer this question, but I'd like to hear your question too. Um, isn't it your right to refuse a part of that process? So if you refuse and follow that that fears, it doesn't matter where it starts. So then it escalates because so many people Um, sometimes it certainly looks that way, but I don't think that so many people have complained. Um, I know that uh, frequently, and I, I can't think of any instances where there's been a critical mass of people complaining. It certainly gets there is there is now maybe uh, absolutely, but it's also based on quite a few years. And and uh, I think that that's predicated on on deaths. But deaths those people custody. aren't hurt because have they gone through a civil death Um, they're actually the if, well, it depends on which circumstance you're referring to. The folks that were um, alleged victims of Mike Bagnini all have attorneys. They're all allegedly going to court. And if you Google it, you can follow the individual cases and you can see the collective case for all of these folks. So. Um, they're addressing their grievances. Um, the families of uh, Dr. Hamilton. I'm hard hearing. None of those people that were. Um, I have no idea about the personal circumstances. To a, to a search for deemed to be I have no idea. Oh. I, I don't know. Yes, my friend. Um, what a right. Does law enforcement have concerning your Facebook accounts or 
great question. And I'm going to link that to his question. That's the art. Um, when we're talking about technologies, now there's all sorts of different types of technologies. Anything you have in public, public Facebook profile, um, uh, your, your unprotected tweets, Instagram, all of that, they have a right to see all of that, just like everybody else. So, um, and they do. Uh, and sometimes uh, that's been really good. So, for example, this guy, um, I don't have this PowerPoint, I have another PowerPoint where we're talking about social media. Um, so this knucklehead robs, um, he robbed a convenience store uh, somewhere in the 20s and was wearing a very distinctive sweatshirt that was custom painted. And uh, he's on the security cameras for the store wearing this very distinctive custom painted sweatshirt and hands this handwritten note to the teller to get money. And so they were looking to match suspects and they find this guy's Facebook profile and there he is wearing the same one of a kind sweatshirt and they were able to use that to get a warrant to come in and then see where when they spoke to his mom and they went to this place he had written practice notes for the note thing. So not only did they find the sweatshirt but they found a stupid practice note. Um, and he got caught that way on Facebook. And good, don't rob me. But you, even if you have not committed any legal crime, you still use that. Um, yes, because uh, these, these, this type of, and you should, we should all be very aware that um, if not only local, federal government is looking through trolling and scrolling and taking anything that you put in the public domain, which is Facebook. Now think of Facebook as me just coming out in the street and saying it. I'm standing on my front lawn, and I said, damn, I love classic sliced pizza and organic, cooperatively grown coffee, but not together. And everybody can hear me. Now, if I write that on Facebook and I post it on the internet, that's a much bigger audience than my front lawn. So it's convenient that I may say it. If you don't want other people to read it, don't post it or, or be very concerned with the security checks. And so you can control, and these nuanced and they change, I can control who can see my message. So I share my message here. I may buy my, uh, I may ask some friends and my sisters-in-law what kind of gift I should get my wife and I ask them on Facebook and I make it so she can't see it. I have, um, you know, I try to do a lot of transparent living to model what I think is effective, a good parenting and I share a lot of things about what I do with my kids and how I do things and what I do in the community with other folks and then get engaged in the dialogue. So I try to be positive about it and I use it. Um, other folks share wild things. And think of this also professionally for a job. If my email is bootytasticwonder69 at hotmail and I don't change my email address, it, you know, that's on me. If, if I have my Facebook is clear and transparent and it's me getting wasted at the club and I'm half naked over here, now really jobs aren't supposed to do this. They just passed a law saying you couldn't, as a prospective future employer, ask your employee for their social media uh, passwords to snoop around. Yes, they actually did that. But if I'm posting this stuff publicly, too bad for me. Um, because that's public. That's just the same as if I happen to be in the bar then you can email me at booty test in one day 69 and hot now. And my prospective future employer was sitting there drinking next to me thinking, what the hell is up with this guy? And then the next day I show up for the job interview. Damn, I'm embarrassed. Have we met? <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, we met yesterday. <laughs> so um, so all that stuff is aggregated and sold. Remember also that this is commodified. So we're just taking a look at law enforcement and government, but business is looking at all of this stuff too. And business is determining what ads they give you based on what you're reading, who you want to look at, what books you're looking at, what food you might be interested in, all of these different things. Um, and this leads into the technology. Uh, and it's very scary. Law enforcement is getting aggressively more militarized. You have individuals asking, like Alderman Donovan, why don't you get a tank? from Milwaukee. Um, there are all sorts of interesting new weapons that are used that you can see um, practiced in other areas. There are um, sonar guns, which would allow me to angle a beam, I'm gonna use my friend in the Pico in the back room, but it looks like a bullhorn. And, um, and I can angle a sound beam in between my friend with the green sweater and my friend in the blue um, parka and hat, and actually hit you. And they wouldn't hear it, but it would disrupt your inner ear cause you to drop to your knees in excruciating agony with this weapon. And they use it a lot. You can see it on when they're having uh, demonstrations and riots in Turkey. They used it a lot on organizers there. Um, and these things are tested. And you can look and see this. There's all sorts of new exciting things. There were 
um, devices, true or false, I'm flying internationally, I bring my personal laptop, and TSA wants me to, they want to look through my laptop, they want to read all that stuff. Are they allowed to do that? I'm not saying they're asking me for it, I'm saying, if you want to fly, give me this so we can look through it. Who says they can do that? Who says they can't do that? Who's saying I got to meet all those naked people tomorrow? <laughs> um, they can do that. Post 9-11, after the Patriot Act, we lost a lot of different rights. We gave a lot more power to government. You all became suspects. And you can wait for these things. Now there's science fiction. You can see things. If you had an opportunity, if you have Netflix or um, you have some way of watching English TV, you can see a show called Black Mirror. It really takes an interesting thing. It's great. It takes uh, some of its little graphics, so be careful. It's not appropriate for kids. I don't think it's appropriate for my kids. Um, it uh, takes a look at technology and privacy rights. So it takes things like Google Glasses, and it takes a look of contact lenses where people, when they wanted to fly. Um, so if you were a TSA person, say, okay, show me the last 24 hours, and I'd be able to take what it's seen in the last 24 hours and watch the monitor and show it at like you know 15 times speed. Okay, that's great. And just show me the <coughs> times speed for the last month. Okay, great, you can fly. And backup data retention for things you've seen, and people getting into arguments and saying, uh uh, that's not what you said. And then I just throw up what I saw and go, oh, I guess it was, I'm so sorry. Um, so this is far fetched, but maybe not so far fetched. Recording devices, body cams, all these things are clunky, but think back not too terribly far to your eight tracks and your audio cassettes and the different ways you store data. Even listening to, um, to folks like um, police officers understanding or not understanding how data is compressed or stored, um, knowing that I can sell things to departments because they don't understand how data is, or I have a surplus edge, or, or about new cutting edge technologies. And civil rights has to keep up with these things. So great, I'm wearing a body camera. You've advocated for a body camera, and now I'm wearing it. So what do I do when I, um, when I come to your house and I respond to a call and it's 3 a.m. and the house is messy and this and that, people are dressed funky. What do I do with this data? How long is it saved? For what reason is it saved that long? What kind of protocols exist for me to flag data that I think is important to save? Well, oops, accidentally turn it off. Yes, <laughs> and, and what are the rules that govern the turning on or the turning off of cameras? And now there's new technology behind this. There are new tasers, which when automatically deployed to turn on the body cameras, no matter what. So when you go to soup it up, it goes on. So technology is in a race with this stuff. What happens if footage is leaked of that drunk celebrity or that drunk alderman, as it does get leaked? We've all seen TMZ at 3 in the morning when you couldn't fall asleep. There's always some crazy chaos going on. What are the things that govern that? What are the things that govern the privacy rights of law enforcement officers? When we've been partners for years, let me see, I don't think I yet. Uh, we've been partners for years, and so we're sitting there with our cameras if they're on constantly, talking about whatever it is we're talking about. We need to have a stronger union, or we need to try this coffee, or did you see that great waitress, and blah, blah, blah. There's a right to privacy between these two officers, maybe talking about their captain, how they're not happy with their captain. That also needs to be protected. Um, so the questions you bring up as to what, they have to make sure it's here at the state where you can go, maybe you can't go, sometimes they're private and you need, um, you need membership with law enforcement, where they spill out all of this amazing technology to use, and these amazing flashbangs and, and interesting uh, weapons. Laser technology and plasma technology is not too far off, and so when, when do we get that for our law enforcement? You and I, I can show you now, you can watch the video, and I can show you how to make a little laser with a diode from a DVD burner, and we can go shoot a cat in the butt or pop a balloon with it. So, and that's, that's nothing, that's 50 cents. So I'm sure it's been weaponized and commodified. I'm not sure $7 an hour to teach you to make that. Um, and so these are, these are also very interesting things. And as um, citizens, you can go to the public meetings of the Fire and Police Commission and vote on and say, and talk about the SOPs and what they mean, and people do. How long should a dashboard camera be on? What, what protocols determine how I am to interact with folks when I speak to them? So I know it's getting close, and I just want to um, cover a couple of things real quick. You're like a, a telepath over there. You knew my next thing was here on Snoop. Uh, and we're going to talk about that. Watch for trends, lock your phones. You don't have to waive rights. Um, remember, you can ask to see a copy of the warrant. You say, I don't consent to search of my personal property without a warrant. Now, somebody else asked, yes, my friend. How do you lock your phone? 
How do I lock my phone? That, that's a great question, and then I'm changing from phone to phone. Um, most phones under setting will have a thing that will be labeled, uh, under settings will have a thing labeled security. And if you want afterwards, I can show you how to lock your phone. But um, you have different security settings. Some of them I can use facial recognition. My phone allows me to use facial recognition, thumb recognition, number pad, image, some combination of all those things. Um, those are great. Don't use like really elaborate passwords if you don't remember later on, which is hard. But also know that any phone you have can be hard set deleted and have your whole phone wiped. So maybe you caught some video and law enforcement didn't want you to have that video and it's locked and they don't want you to have it. A few things, I can smash that phone, but the data still may be there and may be taken off. I can delete that video, but the data still may be there as a temporary file and somebody with a skill or a forensic specialist or myself can get that video off of that photo off. Don't take new stuff over. Um, so locking your phone, I can also just wipe your whole phone during a hard reset. But that changes to every phone and it's a little more tricky and it takes a little more time to do. If the police didn't listen, if you feel the police broke the law, do the same as you would for any other law breaking thing. If you were a victim of where I grew up in Flushing, Queens, our house got broken into, you fill out criminal complaints, and you wanted to remember all these things. If I was in a car accident, the car hit me, we exchanged information, I tried to write down with as much detail as possible everything that happened. Remember, if I have the right to videotape or audio record or tape my interaction with law enforcement, but don't do it disrespectfully, don't stick it all up in somebody's face and give them a hard way. If they tell you to back up, if I see uh, an interaction going on with law enforcement in the room and I'm all up on them while they're arresting them, they can tell me to back up. I may be a threat. They don't know who I am. They don't know if I'm going to clunk them with this thing or if I've got some sort of Hydra agent spray this in my phone. Um, and so back up and do these things. Uh, if you feel like law enforcement's broken the law, you write down what time it happened, what intersection it happened at, where it happened, who was there, were there witnesses who observed this thing happen, did you see three other people videotaping this thing, and can you speak to them and say, hey, I'm so-and-so, you just saw my interaction with the police over here, what they did was wrong, they threw everything out of my car on the ground, they left it here in the rain, I didn't even get a ticket, I have no idea where they, they pulled me over, drove me away, could you share that video with me? and share this information. One quick second, I'll get to your next question. Um, so all this information you want to write, and then you file a complaint with the Fire and Police Commission. Frequently you'll call, uh, frequently people call a uh, precinct, or they find out about the second precinct, or the fifth precinct, or the third precinct, and they'll speak to somebody on the phone who will try to dissuade them from doing that, or just bring it down, I'll handle it. Send them to the Fire and Police Commission, which is the body that's designed to receive these things. And just like anything else, just like if you're filing your receipts at your job, keep a photocopy of it just in case it disappears. Even under the best of circumstances, things disappear. Like the money my nephew owes me that he allegedly has mailed me four times. Um, so, um, keep copies of this, and maybe fill this form out with somebody else. There are agencies listed on the back who are happy to help you, or at least steer you in the right direction. They will do so, they will do so free of charge. The police, the Fire and Police Commission has listed multiple organizations on their website that are to serve as community hubs and help you. I will tell you personally, I have called all those organizations and the majority of them don't even know that they're supposed to help you do that. They don't know how to do that. There's a fraction of them that do. The ones that I've listed there, I've personally called and vetted. And even then, you don't know who's answering the phone, an intern or volunteer, they may be confused. Just persevere because you may be doing something to somebody a big service. If it flips your belly, complain. Remember, you don't want it to escalate to the level of people getting shot or people getting violated on the street or an entire community feeling as though they're receiving subpar, second class, racially motivated policing. You want there to be fair and equal uh, policing. Yes, ma'am. Um, I know you mentioned something about the rights of Yeah. And that I cannot think that a lot of police officers and themselves because of what kind of things that we've seen. A lot of really bad worse things might be suffering from PTSD and more recently are they subject to psychological evaluation. That's a great question. Um, and I think that there's some accuracy to that. Uh, I don't know how often. Um, officers that probably changes from jurisdiction to jurisdiction are subject to psychological evaluations. Um, that may be written down here in Milwaukee somewhere, and uh, if it is, uh, it would be easy enough to find in SOPs if we determine that, or please use uh, handbooks. 
Uh, and that's a great question. It's the kind of question you want to bring up. That's come out about a lot um, in regards to the Dontre Hamilton case. Uh, people were talking about crisis intervention training, and not only individuals suffering from this, but also knowing how to handle folks that are mentally ill. There's been a lot of studies talking about um, PTSD in communities that have been over-policed also, um, who are not, who, um, you know, and what types of interactions are garnered now as a result of um, responding or not responding to police officers that I actually view as a threat, more so. I've heard parents testify at Office of Justice Assistance hearings around the state. I grew up raising my, my young black boys to go to the police officers when there was a problem. And then when they were teenagers, I told them to stay away from police officers because they were going to be viewed as a problem. And now that they're adults, they dislike police officers because of all the problems that they've seen. And so um, it, it becomes a really sticky mess. Um, based on um, individuals and vets uh, who may be suffering from PTSD, that's a very valid question. That's part of the fear I have um, earlier of um, taking folks who have maybe a lot of extensive combat experience who may have these issues. Are they getting the help they need as a police officer? Are they in an appropriate environment where um, they're able to act upon their skill set, or maybe their skill sets are so nuanced and specific that being in the school setting isn't the right place for them, or being in um, this area isn't the right place for them, they need to be in a more specific task, like a SWAT or a team that responds to only the most deadly of situations. Um, putting them in other situations is just a power cake waiting for something to happen. Those are great questions, and I have no idea. Well, do you not think that perhaps the legislation might play a part in involving them in something that goes on to both officers to make medical it's possible, and um, to do something like that, you need the help of uh, like the Wisconsin Medical College's Violence Prevention Initiative, which is uh, a local initiative here in Milwaukee um, that's working in viewing things like um, gun death and interactions as a, as a holistic thing, um, and that would be a very big campaign. Uh, but to, before we get to that step, it's best to see what is in place right now, what is broken before we um, prescribe a remedy. So you want to have a triage first to see what's up before we the next course of actions. Um, we talked a little about that. Um, here's the thing on Terry stops and frisking. Uh, to quote Terry versus Ohio, a, a, a frisking to stop and frisk. Uh, but the frisking or pat down was called a Terry stop because the Supreme Court of the U.S. held that police have the authority to limit searchable weapons based on a reasonable and articulable suspicion that the person stopped is armed and dangerous. So, for example, if I stop you in the street and I want to speak to you for a little bit, and I'm a police officer and you're just some guy, and I say, you don't mind if I just pat you down or I'll check you for weapons before we continue. I had no reasonable suspicion to pat him down. He was chewing some gum, he was coming back from the library. Now maybe I talked to him for a little while and I let him go. He should file a complaint. But he should remember the name of the officer if he can, or the identifying officer's badge. A lot of these things, I'm not just saying out of bubbles. I've seen, I have photos of officers here in Milwaukee with black electrical tape over their badges. Not on days, sometimes people have done this as a token, as an homage for a fallen comrade. These are not those days. These were at Occupy uh, Milwaukee or Occupy the Hood events. Now we also do um, something called legal observing where we monitor the, um, we monitor interactions between law enforcement and demonstrators or protesters. The beautiful thing about the United States is you have the right to demonstrate and protest. Free Willy, Justin Bieber should be you know, deported, whatever it is you want to demonstrate on. And the ACLU does this regardless of content. So we have legal observed the KKK and neo Nazis here in Wisconsin. We have legal observed Occupy the Hood, Occupy Milwaukee, the Justice for Dontre folks, um, the anti war protesters. We have legal observed Folks uh, marching for immigrant reform and the counter demonstrations of the folks who think that um, immigrants should go reform somewhere else. And um, we do this regardless of the message. We do this to make sure that their rights as demonstrators are being protected. It's one of the cornerstones of our democracy. Uh, our right to complain, uh, to ask for redress of grievances. And, and one of the things that we've seen in that is that sometimes, I'll get to you in one quick second, is that sometimes, um, even police don't know the rules, as was the case years ago when they wrongfully arrested um, an attorney here and demonstrated during uh, one of the Iraq things. They pulled him out of the march. They didn't like his float. They wanted to ticket him. They arrested the folks um, that were there too. Um, they charged the one guy 
uh, if I recall correctly, well, the whole variety of, uh, of uh, different crimes, including inciting a riot and resisting arrest. And, um, and they made these allegations and they were going to fine them. And then the ACLU, along with um, supporting attorneys, said, that's great, we would like you to see these videotapes first. And they watched the videotapes and realized that the circumstance went down completely differently from what the officer had alleged. So they apologized and they said, okay, we'll just give a few thousand dollars to each of these folks and to make up for their time, inconvenience. And we said, that's great, but rather that, the MPD should train their officers on what the rights of demonstrators are. And for the most part, Milwaukee Police Department has been fantastic with the general large demonstrations. Um, when West Allis had the Klan's folks and the neo-Nazis over there, um, MPD sent their better trained, better outfitted police there because not only was it tumultuous, it coincided with um, this huge 150th Harlem anniversary, and the police there had set up this free speech zone where no weapons were allowed, so a lot of these um, kind of bikers that had weapons that didn't like folks of color that wanted to join the neo-Nazis were being turned away from going to the free speech zone because they didn't want to release their guns and knives. So they were standing amidst all the people they hated. But at the same time, other bikers and a lot of ex-military guys who hated neo-Nazis and clans people who were also armed, who had shown up, were standing right next to these other guys. So it was pretty spooky. And then you had the counter demonstrators um, shouting, you know, elderly folks with tattooed digits for being in, uh, in, um, in concentration camps and folks dressed in like funky, musty Nazi outfits on the other side. It was chaos, it was raining, it was madness. Um, and it was a bold opportunity for shit to hit the fan in a dramatic fashion. But it went well, even when there was potentials for conflict and, and the crowds were liberated because it's a science to working with um, large group conflict and movement of people. Uh, and so uh, there are the rights of all these folks, regardless of how important I find their speech uh, was protected, as was the rights of camp demonstrators. Yes, you had a question, my friend. Yeah, um, having the right to demonstrate and protest, but then, like, the repercussions of that, like, what are the law enforcement rights to recognize you, and then you, like, start experiencing different forms of intimidation when you're away from those protests? Yes. Where, where does that line get? Yes. Lines, but um, can you just, I don't know. I don't have a specific question. Oh, no, that's a great question. How far does that go? Um, certainly, uh, in as much as police officers may act unlawfully or untoward, uh, unlawfully towards uh, demonstrators, they may begin to do things which border on harassment. And so I may know you have a constitutionally protected right to demonstrate here, and then I'm going to spend hours researching all your license plates and finding out what outstanding tickets you have and make sure I ticket all those vehicles. Um, folks may do things like come and knock on your door at 1 a.m. to talk to you about stuff, uh, 3 a.m. I, uh, I may begin to question all your friends. So I've seen you at demonstrations, and I know from looking at your Facebook page that this guy's your teacher, and this one's your girlfriend, and this one's your other friend, and so I start to ask questions. And all of these things have allegedly occurred here in Milwaukee in the past two months. And so what needs to be done then is individuals need to file complaints. They need to have carefully detailed complaints. They need to say which officer came and knocked on the door at 1 a.m. and what they said. They need to say which officers, or at least what numbers on the side of the car that drove around my block. If they can get, you don't want things to be hearsay, just like any other crime being committed, a video is priceless. So you capture these things on video. Here is again, narrative, and invite your friends over, because we're gonna have some popcorn later on, and we're just gonna watch how many times this officer drives around the block. And then we're all captured in video. And as humorous as this is, this is kind of what you need to bolster yourself, because this is scary, because these are people with guns. These are people who dangling their freedom over. Oh man, you put your hands on me, you touched me. I'll kick your ass and arrest you. And these are not the kinds of consequences that we want um, over our heads. So you have to come correctly. You have to come, um, you have to document all the stuff, and you have to keep filing um, reports and charges. You may have to if you feel as though um, the law's been broken, then you get an attorney. If you can afford an attorney, if you can find a pro bono attorney or somebody that can help you out there, there are groups. Um, 
where you can file a complaint or what's called a legal inquiry with the ACLU. We only have 10 folks in the state, there's a little turnaround time, but um, you know, so we can look into it, see if there's been any violation of your civil liberties or civil rights as an individual here in the state. Uh, you can do what other folks do and, and lean on the press for these things. If, it, if there is a compelling story, just a click on the phone, nobody's going to listen to that. There's lots of folks who think lots of things, and we have to wait through that. Electricity is driven from my house. I'm not saying that people have, the FBI is notorious for having um, eavesdropped and wiretapped. We just celebrated Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, Rip Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day, and it was the unlawful monitoring and surveilling of Dr. King illegally for years that got these, um, the Church Commission and other folks, to pass these laws saying the government is not allowed to encroach upon our freedoms to do all this unwarranted and unlawful surveillance. It doesn't mean that I can't do public surveillance of your Facebook page or any of these things you're saying out in public or posting in public, but um, wiretaps, sneaking your house, uh, putting up bugs and stuff. I invite you to go take a look at Red Hour Park and other areas and notice the new portable generator operated um, surveilling equipment that they have there. So big booms with cameras and audio pickup. And remember, if you've ever seen this thing, you can buy the 99 cent version of 99 cent stores. Ornithologists use these things also, just like a sonar gun. It looks like a bullhorn, but it's the reverse. It allows me to hear what the bird is tweeting or hear what folks are whispering off to the side. So when you have casual conversation, at a demonstration or a march, I can now fine tune that and mux that and listen to exactly what they're saying. Dude, she thinks you're cute. The protesting with the dreadlocks over there. Like some man in uniform. So all of these things, remember technology is, is amazing. It's growing in leaps and bounds. And as much as it can be your friend because you can capture things on video, you can video surveil your house, you can you can have um, all sorts of safety measures to Stealing the priceless comic books. Um, but it's also used to encroach upon your freedom. So you take a look at um, some of the more heavily surveilled nations on the planet. You have the United Kingdom and you have North Korea. And there have been lots of studies in how this affects the psychology of the folks living in such a heavily CCTV community. And we are racing towards that now with cameras that automatically give tickets for speeding or for running red lights or posting cameras here, you know business community wants this, or I want that, or these houses have this, or now um, the government is installing that. Speaking of psychological studies, that would be interesting to see how that affects such a country as ours. We have much greater liberties when it comes to free speech than pretty much any other country on the planet, which is great, period. People say, oh, in England, not true. They can use this thing called D5, which put a gag order on the media. If I want it printed, I issue this order, you can't print the story. And they do this from time to time. It's actually covered in the first episode of the Black Mirror TV shows. Um, but they, they've done this on other issues from time to time. Um, yeah, we're losing our rights right away. Yeah. Rapidly, uh, unless you fight for it, unless you advocate for it, and unless you push back. And you do have things that do wide sweeping broad removals, and there's and things like what just happened in, in Illinois recently. And people need to complain, parents need to complain, children need to complain. It's very easy for us to say, Oh, that's that subsection of the community over there that doesn't have anything to do with me. Or if they weren't breaking the law, then what's the problem with getting searched? But then people need to extrapolate this. So, so um, if I am an advocate for gun rights, maybe I don't want the Beloit police coming in my house looking through and encroaching on all these systems. And that gives this uh, link up now between all these different groups who may have been working on different pieces of the pie to work together because they realize different things are being sequestered or, or pushed and pushed and pushed until the little things are given. It's a non-stop negotiation where the waiting game is, is against us. None of us, for the most part, are paid to go to all these things and debate. But we are debating people whose full-time employment is to legislate, to dictate, and to enforce. You're doing this because you happen to have two hours this evening to come hang out with me in the library. But you're not paying to do this. This is free overtime for me. I don't get overtime on salary. What did I get? I got a beautiful bottle of water, which I thank you. <laughs> um, I do this for the gear. But, um, but these are all really important things for you to be civically engaged. You, we need to vote. We need to encourage people to vote. We need to inform our children. The fact that a 10 year old can be interrogated without the parent present in school, you need to tell your kids to zip it. I don't want to talk to you unless my mom or dad are here. Over and over. And believe me, that's weird. If anybody's ever talked to somebody in a position of authority, 
you need to tell them. You need to practice the way. In the same way you encourage your kids not to get in cars with strangers and do other weird things, the after effects may be grievous. Remember, I can tell you anything as a police officer. Look, man, if you don't sign this, you're going to get arrested. Look, I know you didn't steal the iPod, no, but I know the DA can get you off. You just, if you don't sign this, they're going to charge you, you're going to go to jail. Mm, they're going to pass you around and be flavor of the week. Mm, delicious young thing like you. Well, these are now, these are inferences that I'm getting. This is a potential rape, you're saying? These are all sorts of scary implications. Flavor of the reef. Somebody's teddy bear? I'll sign that. He knows the DA. So this 13-year-old boy just made a decision based on fear. Because I can say anything, and I'm getting it. And I do this all the time. Maybe not to this level. What this 13-year-old boy should have known is, Officer, I can't talk to you until my mom's here. I'm so sorry. Or whatever trusted person, my teacher, my counselor, my pastor, my rabbi, whoever it is, find these folks, educate your young people. Because they get in trouble without you, there's nothing you can do. Um, we're kind of out of time, right? Where was I supposed to go into? Yeah. We have a little bit of time. It's up to you guys. I'm happy to open up the questions. Ah. Uh. This is if, if um, let's say I were stopped for a speeding because I was uh, theoretically because I was speeding, and um, the officer asked me to step out of the car, and I I have no idea why. Do I have to get out? Yes, you have to obey a lawful command from the police officer. And this is a great question for a number of reasons. Um, you can ask, do I have to get out? Are you ordering me to get out, officer? Um, the time to debate and to argue with the police isn't there during that interaction. I'm not innocent. Forget this. This is nonsense. Put your hands up, folks. Listen, I'm a very emphatic Spanish guy from Queens. I talk like I make myself communicate by touching you. Somehow, in my mind, I think that I'm imparting my information to you through touch. Uh, that's not real, and we can't touch folks, and we have to be very conscious of the fact that these are folks in a dangerous job, they're trained to be on edge, they may suspect you of all sorts of things before they approach you. So that's not the time to debate. If you feel like your rights are being violated, if you feel like the law enforcement has been um, engaging you in an unlawful matter, then you bring it up in court, you get an attorney, you debate it there, you protest the ticket there, you say what happened. What they're saying happened did not happen. And you do it, because the judge is the arbiter. Uh, it's not for the police officer to decide all of these different circumstances for them to, to either report to a crime, to intercept what they feel to be a possible crime about to be committed, or to ticket you for what they feel is some sort of infraction. Um, so, great question. And the last one is, uh, did you say Illinois? And my, and my friend is about to leave. Feel free to take my card if you want me to come and speak to those young folks. I'm the Irish brother member. Uh, I'm Emilio. There's the only one in Emilio in the ACLU. There's only two that are found in Milwaukee. Cup of coffee. <laughs> um, yes. Did you, did you say Illinois? The people, the residents of Illinois, cannot currently. They can currently audio record, but last year not, they could not. They, but they cannot. They can't uh, video record. Right now, the citizens of Illinois may both video and audio record things for law enforcement. Uh, last year ago, weirdly because of some old vestige of like the wiretap laws, they were allowed to video record, but not audio record. A lot of folks now, especially with the hyper-connectivity we have with the internet, are video recording law enforcement and sending that immediately to um, servers, so that even if you eat my phone or blast it with a laser or beam it out into space, the video is still stored in a server somewhere else. And they use things like Blue Screen or Bamboozer or any of the variety of apps. This may not work as well where you are in a place of bad connectivity and you don't have to reach your 4 g Wi-Fi, and it works not. Yes, my friend. I'm not going to apologize. No apologies. Uh, as far as you know, we talked about before, um, at least you mentioned before, you uh, dealt with public schools before. And private, yeah. Okay, in sessions like this, is this something that you'll be able to do to class or with classroom students? Yeah. Yep, I've done it before. Yeah. I've done it to rooms of several hundred. High school students, I've done it uh, to uh, mixed rooms of 100 people, I've done it to with rooms of like, 10 people. 
just let me know what to expect and anticipate when it comes. Thank you. I can give you my uh, my numbers all there too. I'm extension uh, two two three. Yes, my friend. Two two three. If you just call up and ask me, you know, the shop and all. Thank you. Yes, it's maybe you were done considering what you said or what's on the end of the game. But during stops, what do I have to buy police in terms of either? During a stop on foot or stop on cross? Uh, both. Different. Um, you don't technically have to give over your driver's license when you stop on foot. On foot. In car, you do. Driver's license, insurance registration, insurance registration. In the car. In the car. Uh, but, officer, am I being detained or am I free to go? Are you are you ordering me to give you my license, officer? Uh, and I'm going to file a complaint on you, especially if I feel like I've been unlawfully stopped. Yeah. A lot of individuals are stopped while doing nothing or while walking, and, and these are the complaints we receive. This is what I hear when I do these community events all the time throughout the city of Milwaukee. I was playing ball. I've seen them. Juneteenth. Anybody go to Juneteenth? June 19th? Um, it was like an occupying force that descended on, on MLK Boulevard. The copper, the chopper flew back and forth. You could see police officers, armed police officers on the roofs of many buildings. There were um, what they call pressure points in intersections where there'd be 12 to 15 officers standing back to back in a circle so that the pedestrian traffic had to go around them. And on the sides were mounted officers, officers on bicycles, and, and police motorcades. It was crazy. A couple of weeks later, you went to Brady Street and you saw two police officers having a good time hanging out on the roads. It was poignant and it was disturbing. But it's an indication of how some communities are policed versus how other communities are policed. Two years ago, I saw a fist fight between two 15-year-old girls at Juneteenth. Now, I've been involved in gang intervention, teaching high school, working with boys and girls clubs for years. Normally, in that fist fight, the girls are broken up, stop, they talk about it, maybe, maybe, I'll call mom and dad and have them come down. Both of these girls were put into different paddy wagons, different trucks. Over 30 police officers responded to this fight, just descending on the whole situation. It's crazy. Probably cost a lot too. Yes, my friend. So, in that circumstance, um, suppose those people were just walking down the street, and suppose the police officer said, Well, I think you guys can mention to them, I'm going to take you to the second time. Are they entitled to do that? And what is your course of recourse? I'm not sure. That's a great question. Um, and this is a specific area with which I'm unfamiliar. Um, I, uh, I'll give you my email address and I invite you to ask me these two questions on email. I'll find the answers to it. Um, you can call me on the phone and, uh, and I'm happy to give you these answers. Also, Independence First and Disability Rights Wisconsin does a lot of great um, work in this specific area too, and we work with them frequently. Um, any uh, complaint like this, I would. Uh, Make sure that you remember the officer's name and the person remember the officer's name and file a complaint later. It's all about the complaint. Now I've seen and I've heard um, over the course of years many stories of folks having, and I just witnessed again, uh, somebody have a petite mild seizure outside of a precinct. And police officers reacting to this uh, and and uh, sheriff's department handling it well, recognizing what it was, as, as did a couple other officers, and one officer not recognizing that this individual had epilepsy following them was talking about drugs and was stopped by two other officers, stopped by a sheriff and a police officer saying, let him go, it was a seizure. But wanting to follow this person, which to me showed that this individual did not know what epilepsy was and was not trained in this thing which so many millions of Americans suffer from. Um, so certainly, uh, if somebody's mentally ill, how can you tell if somebody's mentally ill or inebriated or having a seizure or an episode of some sort is suffering from MS or any of a gazillion different things which uh, affect the, the neural pathways in our mind or how we interact or how we express ourselves. Mm -hmm. How do they know? And what does it matter? And, well, it's just a matter of and it may be a matter of opinion. If that happens, the person should file a complaint or reach out to us and file a legal uh, intake form and maybe make advice them better. Thank you.
called the chapter 51. Because <coughs> isn't it, if some, like if I said right now, your presentation, if I, you know, somebody's working on mental illness, and, you know, you should go for, and yeah. I mean, I'm not going to say that. But if you did, how old I mean, if nobody else was here in the room, yeah, I agree. Um, I don't know the specifics behind it. It's not, um, and I will look that up. There's another thing um, I need to um, know a little more about uh, CCW and concealed carry laws here. Those are two areas uh, that I need to get trained on. I'm looking forward to getting trained on to bring that information uh, more into this workshop. So it's a great question. I don't know the answer. Um, I'm happy to take your phone number and get back to you this answer. Okay. We'll give you my phone number and so share it. if a person is stopped by a police officer and they say, okay, you have an open Then, Then that person should say, officer, if I'm not being detained, am I free to go? Right. Because I'd like if to go If they home. say that and the police officer says, you're mentally ill and you're going to a psychic help, what recourse would that person have? They would have to file a complaint on that police officer. So they would be... Don't resist. Don't them. push. Don't run off. All these things will invite arrest. They would say, oh, officer, I disagree with you. I'm going to file a complaint. Or, officer, I disagree with you. And then, wherever they take you, make sure you file a complaint. You can get a juicy lawyer and make some juicy bucks if they wrongly took you for a site violation. And that's worth three classic sliced pizza and that organic free range cocktails. <laughs> Um, but but those types of wrongful situations, people seldom complain about these things. Uh, and if it occurs, and, it, and for whatever reason, people need to complain. These are just reasons. Sometimes police officers ask about immigration status, and they're not supposed to. That's a federal thing. And people need to complain. It's me doing racial profiling. What you look foreign to me because I speak a foreign language. When I'm speaking another language, there's no reason to ask for my citizenship papers or my passport or where I was born. That's not within their jurisdiction. So determining mental illness or if somebody's a threat, again, and from what I understand, and I'm speaking and I'm telling you right off the bat, it's not legal advice and, I, and I'm hazy on this law. The person who's mentally ill needs to be demonstrating um, a threat to someone else or a threat to themselves through harm. And if they're not doing one of those two things, then as I understand it, they shouldn't be detained or taken for a psyche now. And so again, based on everything else, the power rule is, officer, I don't want to talk to you as an attorney. Am I being detained or am I free to go? And then if things, and, and all this is written on the card for your reading pleasure later, and we have it on the website too, and if you want additional copies, we'll send you some. Um, and then, if, just like with anything else, if you had a, a bad time in the airplane, a bad time in the restaurant, you got a subpar something mailed to you, file the plan. Customer service, get it back, hold them accountable. Because unlike the guys sending you faulty electronics, this guy's a gun, he's detaining the time. So that's the, that's the chapter 51, so according to the I don't know anything station, about that. The police officers are entitled to make a determination of mental illness based on what their expertise? No, he's not entitled to make a determination. He has to write well, a, narr a narrative describing the behavior that justifies taking this person and a psychiatrist examines the person. And that person, if they aren't biting heads off of chickens, it'd be spinning out of Milwaukee County Mental Health so quick. And if the psychiatrist decides that the person needs to be there within 72 hours, you're brought in front of a park commissioner who makes a determination whether or not to continue the detention. But a cop is not going to want to write a narrative report detailing all of the things that causes him to take this person for treatment against their will. That's a, a, a unlikely. But the moment a police officer. Well, we can. <laughs> this is great, and we can continue this at the end. I want to thank all of you for coming. Uh, if you have any further questions, you can feel free to contact me. My contact information is on these cards. You can shoot me an email. Um, I go to school. I do kinsinyas, bar mitzvahs. Yeah. 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 Yeah.